Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sid Ipma. I am the campus chaplain for uh, at the University of Ottawa, and uh, this is Feast and Faith, and we've enjoyed a meal together, and now we get to get to the portion of our evening where we get to have our discussion and look at some way in which faith impacts every area of life. Before we get going with tonight's topic, we uh, we like to begin with our weekly three questions, and this is something that we have, do normally in person, but we want to keep up the practice even when we're meeting virtually. And these three questions are meant to to be habits that we uh, ask so that we can shape our our minds and our hearts and our practices. And so uh, we'll be doing these three questions. There'll be a pause between each of the questions, and then we'll open with prayer. And at that point, I'll introduce tonight's guest. So. The first question we ask is, what have others done for you this past week? What have you done for others this past week? And how in this last week have you made time to be still, to make room for God? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have together on Tuesday evenings to explore different parts of your world and to ponder the ways in which you work and to consider how it is that you might be calling us to live out uh, a faithful witness in every area of life. And so we pray, Lord, that you would meet us tonight as we gather and as we uh, look at the subject of, of faith and music and race. And we thank you for tonight's guest, Hannah Willman. We ask that you would guide our discussion with her. And Lord, we thank you for these gifts and these opportunities. May you be praised in all that we say and do. Pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So I would like to welcome uh, tonight's guest. And tonight's guest is uh, PhD student Hannah Wilman. Um, some of you may know Hannah because she's been a student at the University of Ottawa for the last couple of years working on her master's. And uh, near the in September, we had the opportunity to listen to Hannah do her defense of her master's thesis. And uh, that's a privilege. Uh, it's always fun to get to, to hear students uh, present their work. And there's a certain excitement about, about the end of a journey and a celebration with that. And that was exciting. But I was very intrigued by uh, Hannah's uh, thesis and looking at the subject of, of music and uh, how, um, faith interacts with that, but also just the, the aspect of, of cultural appropriation, race uh, appropriation, and, and thinking about how sometimes there are, are things that take place in the history of music that we don't even realize, and how it, it ends up shaping a discourse that carries on um, over the decades and centuries. And uh, these are things that I think uh, impact um, the way we do, the way we listen to music and the way we uh, uh, do liturgical aspects of church even. And, and I thought this would just be a, a wonderful opportunity to, to highlight um, Hannah's work, um, but also she's, she's pursuing it even further in, this, in PhD studies. And uh, I thought it would be great for us to interact with this topic tonight. So I asked if she'd be willing to join us. So thanks Hannah for joining us tonight. Awesome, thanks Ben, it's good to be here. So I thought where we would begin is that at least just to um, have an opportunity for you to introduce yourself a little bit and be able to uh, give everybody a, a window into why is it, A, that you're passionate about music and that you ended up in this, this journey of, of doing a master's and PhD in musicology, um, but then to, um, yeah, just take us down that journey a little bit. Like, uh, how did you end up where you, where you have here at the University of Ottawa? Sure. Well, um, I guess it basically starts when my mom was pregnant with me. Um, 
she loved to listen to music. She played piano and I was just surrounded by music from even before I was born. So that's, that's kind of my context. Um, a lot of that music was Baroque. So Bach, Handel, that kind of era. And I grew up loving that music. Like even now it still feels like home to me. Um, when I was 10 years old, my family was attending an Anglican church in New Zealand because I grew up in New Zealand. And I saw someone playing the flute. And I said to my mom, I want to play that instrument. Um, and at that time, I was a little bit too small to play because your, your arms have to be strong enough to hold the flute. Um, so I played recorder first and then started playing the flute uh, a little bit after I turned 10. Um, and just never, never stopped. Um, then we came up to Canada. I did a year of Bible college and I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to keep studying the Bible. Um, I was enrolled in an intercultural studies program, um, but God kind of shut that door. It just did not work for me to continue in that program. Um, and so I was kind of stuck and one of my professors suggested to me that I go and study music. And I thought, okay, I could do that. So then I went to Ambrose in Calgary and did a bachelor's degree in flute performance. And towards the end of that, another one of my professors suggested that I should continue into graduate studies. Um, and after talking to some friends about it and praying about it, um, this spot at the University of Ottawa just seemed really good with um, doing a master's degree in musicology, switching out of performance because I didn't want to teach and I didn't want to play in an orchestra. This gave me the opportunity to really read and write um, other things that I love to do. So here I am and I did not imagine that I would stay on at the University of Ottawa to do a PhD, but it kind of became apparent that this was the best choice uh, in terms of what I want to research now that I'm researching um, multiculturalism and Canadian music. So that's how I got here. So introduce us then to uh, what your master's thesis was and uh, tell us how did you end up narrowing down on what it is you were going to focus in on? So this is a very interesting kind of turn of events. Um, I did not come to the University of Ottawa intending to study Horatio Parker. I had never heard of Horatio Parker um, until this time two years ago. Um, with musicology, generally, if you don't know a second language or a third language for that matter, you need to pick a subject. Um, that spoke the language that you're familiar with so that you're able to do primary source research. Um, so I was, I had that kind of parameter of needing to uh, study someone who spoke English. And the only kind of composer that I had a little bit of interest in with that was Charles Ives. Um, now, if any of you are familiar with Charles Ives, you know, he was a very kind of experimental composer, considered a modernist. Um, he was an American. And there's been lots written about him. Like I went to the library and there are shelf upon shelf of books for Charles Ives. So I went back to my supervisor, Professor Moore, and said, what do I do? I've hit this roadblock. There's too much information. And he suggested that I look back a generation. So I looked back a generation and found this circle of composers. Um, they were kind of informally called the Boston Six. Um, Horatio Parker was one of them. And I don't really know why, but he just kind of piqued my interest, um, probably because he's one of the fewest uh, known, like the, the least known from that group of six. Um, George Chadwick is also in that group and Amy Beach and both of those have been a little bit more studied. So I kind of went with Horatio Parker because there was not much that had been said about him. In fact, there were only two books in the library on Horatio Parker. So tell us about Horatio Parker, because uh, I think for this journey, it's helpful for us to have a little bit of a biographical sketch of him. <laughs> 
So he was born in 1863 um, in the New England area. And he started learning music from his mother. Um, he didn't really like pick up, pick it up right away. It was like by the time he was a teenager was when he started really uh, investing in music. Um, and then he started studying with George Chadwick. Uh, and George Chadwick recommended that he go to Europe to study. So when he was 18, Parker went off to Europe and studied in Munich um, for several years. And there he met his wife. They got married. He came back to the States. They both came back to the States. Um, and once he was reestablished, um, he kind of rotated between Boston and New York. He was employed at several different churches as organist, um, as music kind of director. He was also employed at the New York Conservatory, um, where Antony Dvorak was the head at that time for at least a year or two. So there's this little overlap between Parker and Dvorak, which kind of becomes interesting in discussing his context and what he was involved with, with in music. Um, so after his time in New York and Boston, Parker is appointed to the position of Dean of the School of Music at Yale. So he moves to New Haven and that's where he spends the rest of his life. And while he's in New Haven, he also serves as the music director at Christ Church. So um, now let's more specifically then in your, your master's thesis, one of the, the topics that I was, was interested um, in, in delving into and, and why this was intriguing to me was the subject of, of race and appropriation. Thinking about his work in the church and writing hymns and you know, which hymns are coming to prominence, but then also interacting with you know, what songs are the songs being sung, but what songs aren't being sung. And when singing about uh, your cultural situation, how are you singing about that cultural situation? I mean, it's a lot of different themes, and, but maybe you can zone in for us a little bit more of where your research led in terms of a, a topic of study. Sure. So as I just mentioned, um, Parker was somewhat involved with Dvorak and Dvorak was a well-known Czech composer who had come to the States um, with the express purpose of helping the American composers kind of define a national style. And the way Dvorak suggested that was done was to draw on the musics of African Americans and Native Americans. Um, and if you've studied any music history at all, you've probably heard of Dvorak's New World Symphony, um, which supposedly drew on these other musical sources. So this raised a whole conversation about cultural appropriation. Is it appropriate to borrow music? Um, how are the cultures represented? Um, and there are debates about Dvorak and his techniques and his ideas and goals. Um, and even in my study, it was interesting to see how some scholars talk about Dvorak um, and the language that they use. Um, there was one scholar who said, that Dvorak validated African-American music by including it <laughs> in this piece. And I just thought this is just such an unhelpful way of speaking about the music of another culture. So this is kind of the context that Parker entered into. There's these big debates about what American music is and how to interact with the music of African-Americans and Native Americans. Um, so to kind of give myself some more space and background to look at that, um, I had to try and find out where Parker sat uh, in this discussion and what he thought about that. And it very quickly became apparent that he had some pretty racist ideas. Um, he wrote some lectures about American music and basically implied that African Americans were intellectually inferior and that the music of any other culture that drew on the pentatonic scale was just kind of bass. He had this like very 
internalized sense of what is high music and what is low music. And unfortunately, that often resulted in this like exclusion of other cultures. So yeah, I kind of drew that out. Um, it doesn't become apparent in his hymn writing so much, um, but his, well, there's two ways. So the, the pentatonic scale that Parker had criticized, um, we'll just side note that for a minute. He edited a hymn book, um, and most of what he did in editing this hymn book was try to make the music more complex because that's that was his frame of reference for what was good music like he wanted the church to have good music and music that would honor god but his framework for that was this very intricate very beautiful music um so one of the things i found was that um, he wrote a setting of the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And it, I used it as an example of how he had this very Western tonal vocabulary that was like added these chromaticisms to make it complex and to make it interesting. But it didn't really survive. Um, and the pentatonic music that he had said was not interesting or that it it was common to all peoples was kind of what he said. He kind of like brushed it off with that. But it's interesting to see that actually the melody that um, has remained most popular for How Firm a Foundation is a pentatonic melody. So it's interesting that, you know, this thing that Parker has critiqued has actually remained uh, so prominent. So that was one kind of way that I showed his his bias and his racial prejudice. Um, the other way was in looking at uh, a series of music education books that he was the editor for. And the introduction to this uh, series, he says, um, this is going to draw on the best music that the world has to offer. And so I started doing a bit of a survey of what was included in this book. And it's mostly English and French works. Um, there's some folk songs um, from places like Lithuania or Sweden. But it's, it was very interesting to see what was missing. There was no reference to African American music in this little textbook that he had. And whenever he included and his team, because it was a team, he was just the head editor. Um, whenever they included references to indigenous peoples, it was all very stereotypical, like these kind of racist portrayals, um, which was hard. It was hard to come face to face with that and realize that, you know, a composer that I admire and that has done some great work for the church also had these, um, really prominent racist prejudices. I mean, uh, um, well, I've got a few questions. First, uh, mm -hmm. you have to forgive that a lot of us aren't necessarily music students. So um, explaining terminology might be helpful for a few of us when, when it comes to some of those types of things. So uh, the phrase you used was pentatonic, correct? Yes. Uh, and I could probably, uh, use language to, to, to figure that out, but maybe if you could just explain that so we're all clear about what that is. Sure. So in the Western tonal system, normally we use uh, a scale of eight notes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, roughly. Um, but the pentatonic scale, which it is quite common around the world, um, is based on five notes, obviously the, the penta there. Um, and it's, oh gosh, now I have to sing it. <laughs> um, one, two, three, five, six, one, six, five, three, two, one. So that's your pentatonic scale. 
there's just a couple of more leaps. It's more um, open. Um, so, you know, again, I'm going to plead my ignorance here, but uh, why then would it, would that be considered um, less intelligent or less um, valuable? Uh, why was it looked down upon? And, and mm. like, what's the lens then for, for one culture looking at another culture's music and saying, well, it's not as good as ours? Yeah, it's a tough thing to kind of grasp. Um, basically, what I put it down to in my research is I drew this parallel between a false hierarchy that is implied by racism and what I called the false hierarchy of transcendence. So racism basically exalts white people and white cultures to the top of this pyramid. And it comes from some research. Um, I can't remember the name of the scholar, but a couple hundred years ago, um, there was this research done that said white people are more intelligent, they're more capable, and then it kind of makes this pyramid um, with other cultures underneath. And so you've got this false hierarchy over here, and then transcendence is this kind of philosophical approach uh, to music that views music as a means of accessing what is beyond. So whether it's our connection to God or just our means of expressing what is beyond expressing in words, our means of expressing this kind of spiritual connection. So that was the cultural understanding of music for Western society in the late 1800s. It had come as a result of um, all of this classical music, like Beethoven especially was deemed as one who composed music that was transcendent. And what happened with Beethoven's music was that moving from music being seen as the means of transcendence, music became viewed as the object of transcendence. So music came to have this religious power in and of itself, so much so that it became the object of religious devotion. Um, and much of the classical tradition kind of draws on that concept. That's why we have, you know, the, the musical canon, all these works that are very common. That's why Beethoven is so kind of idolized. Um, it's really, really problematic because you get this pyramid of transcendence with Beethoven at the top and other Western composers. And then beneath that kind of just the music of other cultures, Beethoven and white Western composers becomes the standard against which all other music is evaluated. And so that's why I think Parker wanted to have really complex music in his hymns, as opposed to this perceived more simple um, pentatonic music. So that, that, I mean, that leads me to asking the question, like, and maybe it's a chicken egg sort of thing, but does the church then, um, as, as, it, as, a, as a place, as certainly 200 years ago, where it would have been a primary place where music is distributed and, 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 and shared, um, does it become a place where uh, racism is almost perpetuated through the through the music of the church, um, uh, or is it is it just coming as a result of, and it's not not really to blame, um, but it just is a is a part of the the entire cultural scene. Like, what where where is the place of the church in, mm. in adopting this sort of attitude? Like, you'd think almost in some respects that that the church in its history, as it's as it's called to lift up the least and the lost and the lonely, would have possibly looked at music and, and looked at some of these cultural gifts of other places in a different light than the rest of culture, and yet it doesn't. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it was kind of surprising to me to come face to face with Parker, who claimed to be a Christian. Um, and like you said, the responsibility of the church and the things that Jesus calls us to is to care for the poor and um, the outsider and the oppressed um, and make sure their voices are heard and, you know, their value, they are of value in the kingdom of God. Um, so, yeah, I think I agree that that is definitely the role that the church should have. Um, certainly in Parker's case, it wasn't. It's hard to know how much of it was just because, you know, the culture just kind of overtook like this, the racist paradigms that were in place, like the racist paradigms that we still see in place, there's still conflict in the church. Um, it just, there's, there's room. There's still many questions about how to tackle it and how to, how to move forward, I guess. But, and, and so that's what I, I guess, because there, there is an implication there that on one hand, we talk about striving for Christian excellence. And so the church and its liturgical forms, uh, you know, it, it wants to do things in a way that's the best. But how do we balance that in terms of, you know, what is our lens for what's the best? Um, I think we can see that in the culture wars of, of music in the church even today. So how, how, yeah, I'm trying to frame the question. Like, and maybe the question is, do we still have this same problem 200 years later? Or, or mm -hmm. have we gotten any better with the subject of race and appropriation and being able to value uh, the music that's coming from, from different uh, cultural corners, even within the Christian church itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly an ongoing conversation, but I think some of the things that I've learned through this study and through other research that I'm doing, other courses that I've taken, the more you start to explore, the more you kind of have an understanding of what options there are out there. Um, so to kind of make some concrete examples here for us to to kind of grab onto. Um, the thing I love about Beethoven's Ninth, which is probably the most well-known Beethoven symphony um, and the most overplayed, but it is wonderful. The ending of that work, what it does, that the text and the music together envisions worship at the throne of God, which is powerful and beautiful and absolutely necessary. And music that does that is really, what, what other reason do we need for music? Um, but when that becomes the standard, when that becomes the only vision of worship the kingdom of God, I think we miss the scriptural vision because Revelation says every nation, tribe, and tongue. So that's why we have to learn from other cultures and learn from Christians, especially from other cultures. Like it's hard to compare music in one culture with music in another culture because the understanding of music is just so culturally embedded. So this summer I had the privilege of taking um, a class on indigenous theologies and methods uh, through Regent. And one of the things I learned was how the process of music is different in indigenous culture. So for example, um, Western music, we have this concept called intertextuality, which basically means you make reference to another piece of music in your piece of music. So in pop music, it's called sampling. In classical music, we call it intertextuality. 
So for example, if I can play you a piece from Parker, this is one of, or it's a movement from one of his works, which also envisions worship at the throne of God. This piece is all about what worship will be like in heaven. And he draws on the imagery in Revelation of the marriage of Christ and the church. And so at the very moment in this piece that the text calls a, talks about the marriage ceremony, Parker makes reference to a work that I'm sure most of us will recognize. It is the wedding march that Mendelssohn wrote. Um, so you can see this kind of borrowing. So Sid, do you think it will let me share my screen? Yes. All right. Um, so you should be able to hear and recognize where Parker is borrowing from Mendelssohn in this little clip. Did you hear that? It's a very few couple of chords that um, makes reference to Mendelssohn. So Parker borrows from Mendelssohn. We have no problem with that. We don't call it cultural appropriation, even though Mendelssohn is German, Parker is American. It's fine. It's very common in classical music to do this. Um, and it's one of the most interesting things to research, to be honest. And Parker does it a lot. And I think within the Christian context of classical music, it's a way of drawing together the worship of different generations and drawing together our worship and offering it to God. But going back to my um, course this summer, my Indigenous course that I took, I learned that Indigenous cultures have a completely different understanding of ownership in music and through storytelling. And the professor in this class said that he would never share a story that he had not been given permission to tell. And I think that's why understanding cultural appropriation is so challenging because for Western culture, we are free, especially in classical music, to borrow and share and exchange, and that's, that's part of the process. But it's very different in Indigenous cultures. Um, and so that's why I think in, in church and in music, we have to be careful that we're not just borrowing for the sake of borrowing, but there's actually some partnership. And where there is partnership, that's where I think um, we will profit the most by learning from each other um, and opening our eyes to greater diversity of music. You have an example where you've seen this done well? Actually, um, let me pull it up over here. It's not a song that is sung, um, but this is one of my favorite uh, Christian worship songs. Um, so it's done by Joshua Aaron and he is um, a Messianic Jew um, with American heritage as well. So he's part Jewish, part American. And he collaborated with a Native American chief um, Chief Riverwind. So let me share my screen again. Um, and this was when they performed this song called Every Tribe and they performed it in Israel. Let's give a shout to our great chief cornerstone, Yeshua! 
So with that one, it's easy to see that it's not appropriation because the people who are involved, the different cultures that are involved are represented. I think often, um, at least in scholarship that I've read um, in classical music that critiques appropriation, the problem is often that the people are not represented. The musical objects are extracted from the culture and there's no exchange, there's no storytelling and sharing. It's, it's basically stealing. Um, but this one, you've clearly got um, Joshua Aaron, who's the lead singer, and then behind him was another Jewish musician who's playing a traditional um, Israeli instrument. And then you've got Chief Riverwind and his wife. So they're able to collaborate. Um, and I think this is also a picture of worship at the throne of God. Um, so we have Beethoven's vision of worship at the throne of God, and then we have Joshua Aaron's vision with Chief Riverwind of worship at the throne of God. And they're two very valuable pieces, but to compare them and to say that one is better or of greater quality than the other, I think just completely... Yeah, when when you put it this way, then it, it seems to me that until our churches have more diversity, it's difficult to sometimes balance this type of good collaborative sharing, um, mm -hmm. because each of the different churches often look like silos of different uh, uh, of different cultures. So it becomes difficult to do good sharing. Would would you mm -hmm. say that's fairly accurate? And... Yeah, I think so. Um... The only other case is where music is gifted from one church community to another. And I've experienced that. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Urbana conference run by InterVarsity once every three years. They're very good at including multicultural worship where songs from one, a church in one culture are gifted to a community in another culture. And so even if the people aren't necessarily present the song has been taught and shared from those people and it's offered as a gift. Hmm. So I just one more question for me and then I want to, I want to give everybody else, everybody else a chance to, to jump in with maybe where their thoughts are on the subject. But so for you personally, where's, where is the, where has your faith been strengthened in this journey you've been taking and where has it uh, been challenged? Um, Taking on a project as big as master's thesis is just hugely challenging. Um, and just to see how God has sustained me through it and how he led me to a topic that is so close to my heart. I think I mentioned way back at the beginning um, that I had been enrolled in an intercultural studies program um, that were closed. I couldn't continue with that life like for the last seven or so years I've kind of had these two things fighting each other um, you study intercultural studies and see how it has brought them together hand in hand has been amazing um, the thing where I have seen God kind of strengthen my faith in this at the very beginning of or I guess in my second semester of my thesis, um, I was really unsure of what I was doing still. I didn't really see how my faith was integrating with the work I was doing. Um, but a friend of mine led a study on the book of Colossians. And the verse that really stood out to me um, in that study 
study was um, that God is reconciling all things to himself. And as we studied that, I kind of asked God the question, even musicology, are you even reconciling musicology to yourself? And I felt like his answer was yes, of course, all things. God is reconciling all things to himself. So that was the kind of verse that I clung to as I studied this and to see how um, all the different pieces of this research have come together. Like I did not imagine in my first year I would be able to worship at the throne of God in my master's thesis. I did not conceive of that being an option. <laughs> um, but it's been so good to see, like, when you put music in that context, it undoes the false hierarchies because everyone bows before the throne of God. So racism, the false hierarchism is undone realizes Beethoven is undone and all of this music is just able to be offered to God as a gift. So of course you bring Colossians 1 into it and pardon the pun it's music to my ears. So, <laughs> um, I would uh, love to open it up <clears throat> to any questions that uh, others of you might have uh, for Hannah um, about her studies or about this topic about music and appropriation um, or something related therein, uh, you can ask in the chat box and I can ask for you or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask Hannah directly. Hey. I have a question. Um, really interesting stuff. Usually I'm not into uh, like music history as much, but the, when you describe it, in, I, I was interested, so that's really cool. Um, <laughs> uh, when, when you talk about uh, like taking music from different cultures and how it's important that it's, there's some sort of partnership there or that is, is given or, or shared in some way by a person of that culture, and if it's not like that, then it's kind of like stealing. Are you talking about specific songs or are you talking about like musical techniques too that are kind of from that culture? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, hard to know. I'm still learning a lot about that and what it means. And it kind of depends on the context. So for example, there are, when, it, when it's just musical techniques, they're often stereotyped. And so it's hard to isolate a musical technique to a culture. Um, so generally I think it's kind of both. You need an expanded understanding of the techniques that are involved um, because normally complete songs are not, um, appropriated. It's usually snippets or techniques. And then those techniques are portrayed in a way that is a stereotype. So the most obvious one um, that we hear in classical music, and it's in a lot of very basic, um, like beginner piano books, the strong, weak, weak, weak rhythm for a Native American drum beat. Um, and when that's combined with maybe some lyrics that are racist or it's just, it condenses all this like the intricacy of the culture to a tiny snippet. Um, and these little snippets just don't capture, um, yeah, like I said, the beauty and so. Yeah. Like, so, so you'd say it's more um, yeah, because, like, I, I'm a composer and I'll often be listening to music um, 
of other cultures and hear like really cool techniques and, and be inspired by them and want to kind of use them because because I kind of think of music as something kind of beyond culture as a whole like it doesn't really belong to people um I, I don't know maybe, maybe you disagree with that but uh I don't know because because I I see the the danger and in, in music being too much of like a, something that we can own, that it can kind of get in the way of the advancement of creating really cool music just by having any kind of technique available um, to any composer, you know? But I do mm -hmm. agree that there is danger also in taking a technique and uh, kind of like making fun of the culture with it or, or, or minimizing the culture. Yeah. Yeah, and I would tend to agree with you. We, um think most Christian composers and most Western composers would agree with you that we want this to go forward so we need to have more techniques more more diversity and we can only get that different things but it goes back to what I was saying earlier about different cultures have different understandings of that so um, for example I don't know if you've heard of Tanya Tagak. She's uh, an Inuit throat singer. Um, and there was a composer who used some Inuit throat singing. And just really hurt and upset that this, this throat singing had been used in a context that was not its intended context. So while our concept and how appropriate it is to use it in different circumstances. We understand that really well. It's also, it's still such a learning process for me of like, oh, different cultures have this different understanding of where music can be played, how music can be played, and even who within the culture gets to perform and sing music that comes up in Western culture as prominently. Other questions? I have a question. Um, what are ways like the Canadian church in particular can be more inclusive of music and from other cultures or like or like I guess like interacting people so that they can like respectfully borrow these songs. Um also I've been to Urbana twice and I can like amazing stuff. They're really good at like like taking uh songs from like different groups around like and a lot of them are students so that's pretty cool. Yeah, also a good question. Um, I truly wonder about this myself, because like Sid said, until we have churches that look more diverse, the collaboration doesn't really happen. Um, I think a lot of it is education. A lot of it is undoing the Beethoven idolatry, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, just starting to learn that there is other music, there is other Christian music out there. Like, I don't know how many of you had heard of Joshua Aaron before, um, but just expanding our horizons. Like I've started to make a point myself of listening to worship songs that aren't in English or worship songs that aren't written by Western composers, just as a way of learning for myself and then as opportunities arise like as you meet people um, in your church or people to your church who aren't of a north american background then we will have the opportunities for collaboration there's a really good book about this um by sandra maria van opstal highly recommend um i can send you the title but i can't remember it off the top of my head yeah, if you can get it to me, I can always um, put it out later as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and just picking up on that that thread. My fear is that at times it also becomes this kind of uh, almost hipster approach to church where you want to create that which is novel and new and oh look look at me I'm I'm bringing in this particular indigenous piece because I want to be sensitive to uh, you know our our First Nations brothers and sisters and it can sound like you're um, doing something good but it can also f doesn't feel authentic because it isn't necessarily the voice of the people like it isn't really mm -hmm. raising a collective voice as it is um, doing something other than maybe what is supposed to be happening. But then there is room for what you're saying that at times moving outside of ourselves and taking in a voice from another culture to allow that voice to also breathe within your midst is a way of, of moving a congregation beyond itself and not just simply be focused on themselves. So th there seems to be a tension there and, I, and that a very difficult one. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. But it's worth doing because I think that's what God calls us to. Like, I know I keep going back to this, but envisioning worship at the throne of God, like when we envision what worship will look like at the throne of God, it is every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so I think as we start walking towards that um we'll learn we'll make mistakes but it's a good gift any other questions for for hannah that people have i just have a quick question um just other than the, the already do you have any favorite things you've come across that you maybe wouldn't have in the study that you would recommend hmm. not presently um the urbana albums for sure um joshua aaron for sure um Yeah, even just listening to Canadian Indigenous artists um, is really insightful for me. So that's what I'm kind of exploring right now. Um, yeah, those are good starting points, though. <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, I'll go. I guess I had uh, a question around like, like doing this kind of research or like studying music in this way and understanding like the stereotypes or like the, the racism that people had. Um, I mean, in terms of the people who, who get to, who get to, Oh, okay. Wait, I, I don't know how. To... I guess, I guess. What is the practical aspect of like learning about these people in, in the past? Because I, I, yeah, I think like the, isn't a really big issue that churches are simply not diverse. Like most churches are not not diverse, and yeah, like what was the point of talking about it, or like talking about how like oh people who like were in prominence were racist or or whatever and so like they they made the music i don't know like the culture at that time was also much different right so you mean basically why do the historical study yeah kind of <laughs> like what what is the practical like how is this a like I, I i think it's interesting right like i think but to me it just 
came off as like, oh, wealthy people in the past who had the access to make music, made popular music, also held, you know, these views that were also common in culture, right? I think mm -hmm. it's much more common back then to see your own culture as being superior to another with like less access to other cultures. Like it, it doesn't seem novel to me. I don't know how to use this history and like where music comes from because I, I think yeah, uh, like respecting indigenous people or like other cultures who like value music and see music uh, more more closely to their identity rather than just like some fun thing you do. I, I think that's like part of learning another culture and learning to love them in terms of just like learning about racist old people who made music. Like, what, like what, where does that translate into something useful? Yeah, I think a little bit you answered your own question that it's part of the process is learning to know other cultures and love other cultures through their music. Um, when it comes to why study old dead white guys, um, I think for me at least it was an interesting opportunity um, to learn to see that yeah, it is easy for a Christian to be complicit in the sins of their culture. It is easy for a Christian to go along with what has been done and what has been said, and not actually stand up for what God says and what the Bible says. Um, so that was eye-opening for me. Um, and then part of it is also just, I am a musicologist. Musicology is my discipline. We study music history. We study how we got to where we are today. Um, and in terms of practical applications for that, well, having done this study on race uh, in America 100 years ago, my study now is on race in Canada in the last like 40 or so years and how Canada in the present day still rehearses this white majority um, emphasis in music at the expense of cultural minorities. So there is a practical application for understanding historical contexts and seeing how that works out in the present day. Those who do not yeah, no, thank you. history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Thank you for explaining that. Like, so in a way, sharing people how these old composers whose like music is influential in their churches today, it, it'll, it'll draw a closer connection to them uh, about how it's still like an issue today and how we're more aware and we'll be able to act differently. Mm -hmm. Being cognizant of time, it, it's seven o'clock. And so I, I do want to wrap it up unless there's somebody that has a, a deep burning question that they need to, to get in. Um, you have to speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us tonight and being able to take us into your world and get us to think about these topics. I do think that as you point out with your current study, um, these topics exist all around us, and the church needs to think about how um, it can be um, complicit to, to attitudes and that shows up in, in how they practice their faith as well. So uh, I certainly appreciate that, um, that component of this, but also thinking about the all things reality that we do want to think about how music and the life uh, and music, which is such an important part of all of our lives. Um, we, we do want to make sure that we're thinking about how it is a part of the kingdom of God and, and that we're participating in it well. And so thank you for helping us participate in music well as a part of the kingdom of God. I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to do this tonight.